Welcome back to the Look and Sound of Leadership, an ongoing series of executive coaching tips designed to help you be perceived in the workplace the way you want to be perceived. I'm Tom Henschel, your executive coach, and today we're talking about taming the wild child. Maxine was going to be a star if she could just get out of her own way. Those were the words on the street about Maxine. They were even her words about herself. During a coaching session, after she had spoken the phrase once again, I asked her what it meant for her to get in her own way. She replied without a pause, Oh, you've heard me do it, Tom. I suddenly start talking really fast, and I can't stop. I'm just jabbering away. And why is that getting in your own way, I asked. Because I suddenly sound like a girl, and being a girl around here gets you nowhere. But it's how I feel, like a jumpy teenager. When it comes over me, I'm not effective at all. And, Max, what is it that comes over you? Oh, golly. She took a big breath as if the list of things that came over her was long. And then she breathed out. After a minute, she shook her head and smiled and said, It's just hard work, that's all. And getting the work right is important to me. We've talked about this, Tom. I really hate making mistakes. So when something feels important, I get in my own way. I nodded but didn't speak. She went on, Isn't it ironic? I try so hard not to make mistakes that I get in my own way, which is a mistake. What would you change if you could, I asked. I'd stop that babbling stream of words, and I would stop apologizing. That's another one where I kick myself later. I look back and I think, what was that? You've known better than that since high school. What were you thinking? And the answer is, I asked, well, I wasn't thinking. Well, Max, someone's behind the wheel, right? Someone's making the decision to keep talking or to apologize. Who is it? I don't know, she said feels like some stressed-out teenager. Is that you? I asked. Were you a stressed-out teenager? Did you talk really fast and apologize a lot? She laughed. Well, yeah, that was definitely one part of me. Yes, but I was super serious, too, and I always was one of the smart kids. But yes, for sure, I babbled sometimes. And what purpose did your babbling serve back then, I asked. It was like if I could talk fast enough, throw enough ideas up in the air... I'd distract everyone from noticing I wasn't really as smart as everybody thought I was. My little Miss Perfect mask was slipping, and, well, you know, when in doubt, you baffle them with bullshit, right? Did it work, I asked. Well, sometimes, yeah. So that babbling teenager served a purpose sometimes. I suppose she did, she said. I wouldn't have said so. Why, what would you have said, I asked. I would have said her only purpose was to be scared. I got pretty frantic when I thought my little Miss Perfect mask might be slipping. Well, what about these days, I asked. Are you nervous now? Is the mask slipping? She thought, and then looked and said quite confidently, No, I don't think so. Then she narrowed her eyes and said, But then why does she show up? The parallel's not there. Does there have to be a reason for that frightened teenager to show up, I asked. Well, doesn't there? She used to show up when I was afraid things were going wrong. So why is she showing up now? There's nothing wrong. Well, in my experience, Maxine, there's not always a logical explanation. At least not one I can figure out when it happens to me. This happens to you, she asked. Oh, yeah. But my saboteur is younger than yours. Mine is little Tommy. (laughs) "'Little Tommy?' she laughed. "'And what does little Tommy do?' "'Oh, sometimes he doesn't do anything at all,' I said. "'Sometimes he's just a feeling. "'Like you, it comes over me. "'I'm suddenly little Tommy, and I feel less than everyone else.' "'Oh, yuck. "'Yeah, yuck. "'But as far as I can tell, there's not always a rational reason why he shows up. "'I mean, sometimes I can look back and go, oh, yeah.' Yeah, all the trigger elements were in place. I understand why that happened. But other times I look back and I haven't a clue. But you have a little Tommy, she said with a bit of wonder. You even gave him a name. I did. I have spent a lot of time with little Tommy. He's just a kid. He means well. 
This is hysterical, she said, like he's a person. Well, he is, I said, in the same way your teenager is a person. He is a specific part of me that has habits and behaviors like every other part of me. But the problem with the little Tommy part of me is that he comes from my fear part. His very nature is to be afraid. Being fearful is all he can do. Fear is his only contribution. So when little Tommy shows up, often (laughs) for no reason at all, right, I want to have an antidote. Little Tommy's fear is contagious. When I catch what he's got, I feel bad about myself. And then, well, that used to just make me so angry. I'd think to myself, damn it, kid, get out of here. You're going to make me look bad. I would find myself in a wrestling match with my little Tommy trying to get him to (laughs) amscray. She laughed. That's never happened to me, but I completely get it. I sat back, changing gears. Sometimes things got worse. Whatever part of me was taken up by little Tommy, well, that part of me was not focused on the task at hand, right? So I literally had diminished my own capacity. I was not my best. Huh, that sounds familiar, she said. But you make it sound like it's not that way anymore. Well, not as often, I concurred. So how'd you change it? I realized he wasn't trying to upset me. So when I got angry when he would show up, it was like I was throwing a tantrum at a kid who was already throwing a tantrum of his own. Not a great strategy, right? So I started having a little compassion. What does that sound like, she asked. I looked down as if I was talking to a child, and I laid both hands palm down on the air. Very quietly and calmly, I said, Hey, kid, it's okay. I'm the grown-up here. I got this. Thanks for coming by. Love you. And then that's it, Maxine. I'm done with little Tommy. And he goes away. She laughed. Until next time. Right. Yeah, he's going to show up sometime, right? But now when he does, you know, I'm fine. In fact, sometimes I seek him out. You know, there are times I can look ahead on my calendar and I can see an event and I can think, boy, oh boy, that situation has a whole lot of little Tommy's triggers in it. Let me calm him down now before he gets riled up. And I do. And I think about little Tommy and I say, hey, hey, you know that meeting? Looks scary, but I've got it under control, kid. Nothing to worry about. You keep on sleeping. Everything's fine. She gave a little clap. I love that. I'm going to do that. And then she said, Is this what's, what do they call it, talking back to your fear? Is that a thing? Oh, I'm sure, Maxine. I imagine that this is an old, old idea. I used to do a form of this when I was an actor, and I'm pretty sure it was an old idea even then. At which point I told her the story about the near career-ending bout of nervousness that I had when I was an actor in the professional theater. I told that story in an episode called Managing Nervousness back in March 2006. During Maxine's coaching, she really dug in to tame the fearful teenager who made her less than her best. Gaining control over that part of herself allowed her to continue to manifest the look and sound of leadership. So what was the point of this episode? (laughs) I so wish you could go first. I can't wait to hear what you think of this. This idea of separating myself from my fear is really old in my life. It seems as natural to me as the daylight. I also know that there are people who hear this idea and they just do not resonate with it at all. And I'm guessing some of those people right now are wondering what the heck they just listened to. I understand that. But here's how this makes sense to me. As a coach, I talk with people all the time about what they think is getting in their way, you know, whatever that is for him or her. And they talk about it as a part of themselves, not their whole self. They say things like, you know, well, you know, one part of me is really scared to walk into that room. They say that kind of thing. They already identify it as a part of them. And I ask them to tell me about that part of themselves, and they know a lot about that part of themselves. That's the fundamental core idea behind this episode. Whatever is getting in your way is only one part of you, 
and you can think of it as one part of you. Here's another idea that I hope you heard. Fears have purpose. You know, Maxine had didn't, hadn't thought of it that way, but she knew that her frightened teenager served a purpose. She knew that that babbling girl came out when she worried about not being perfect. And lucky her, sometimes that babbling girl actually triumphed, right? But the fear was there for a reason. Same with my little Tommy. My little Tommy served a purpose. He was part of me for my own reasons and my own story, but he served a purpose at a time in my life. As you think about your fears as something separate from you, it can be really helpful to remember, you know, they started for a reason. They started to protect you. Now, maybe they're not so helpful anymore. I understand that. But, you know, have a little compassion for yourself. This month, several listeners asked about offers I had made in past episodes. And they just asked, you know, is that offer still good? So look, I just want to say, if you hear any offer in any episode, anywhere in the archive, every offer I've ever made is still good. (laughs) Sure, of course, happy to. So if you hear something that interests you, I am at the Essential Communications website. It's essentialcom.com. Essentialcom with two M's dot com. Hit the contact button. Let me know what offer interests you, and let me know how you are, and you bet. Happy to do it. Now, while you're on the website, oh my, I am so excited about this. I have been waiting to tell you about this. There is something brand new on the website, and I can't wait to tell you about it. I am creating a partnership with someone from my past. In the early 1990s, as I was just beginning to start Essential Communications... I taught as a professor for a couple of semesters in the drama department at the California State University at San Bernardino. I learned so much being in that role. And one of the things that I learned was that I do not want to teach in the university. But it wasn't because of the kids. The kids were great. And one of those kids came to Hollywood. And that kid was really gifted. And he landed at the Groundlings Theater. Now, you may have heard of the Groundlings Theater because it is world famous for having turned out many, many stars. A lot of stars come out of that program. The Groundlings has a program that is built completely on the craft of improvisation as a theater skill. So there are no scripts. You think on your feet and you learn to create characters and create stories on your feet in real time. It's an an amazing discipline. Improvisation is a craft that requires great freedom. And in the 1950s, freedom was something that was really important in the American theater. That was the discipline, for example, that Marlon Brando came from. A woman named Viola Spolin created theater games to free actors from thinking and get them into listening and reacting. She called it theater games. I learned theater games as part of the curriculum in my high school acting program, so it was a real thing. And interestingly enough, I go to Juilliard where we do almost no theater games at all because, you know, Juilliard wasn't about freedom. Juilliard was about discipline. And I was completely good with that because, to be honest, improvisation scared the hell out of me, (laughs) so I didn't want to do it. Anyone who can do it, oh my gosh, I bow down to them. And that's what they turn out at the Groundlings through this program. And that brings me back to this student from Cal State San Bernardino, right? He lands at the Groundlings, and he goes into that training program. And he progresses. It's hard, and it's competitive. But he emerges, finally, as one of the company's solid players. That was many years ago. And Jeremy Rowley is his name. And Jeremy Rowley is still at the Groundlings. He is the longest tenured performer there. And he still performs once a week there. So Jeremy does many things at the Groundlings. He helped create and teach the next generation of improvisational actors. He also, through the Groundlings, taught lots and lots of non-actors. There are courses, and they may be near you, of improvisation for non-actors. They are great because they force you to loosen up, think freely. They unlock your brain. 
And when teams go through them together, oh my gosh, they're fantastic. So I'm a big believer in them. Now, I would never do one myself. So recently, Jeremy and I are having lunch, and he says, hey, what if I teach an improv for non-actors as part of essential communications? And I was like, oh, yes, that would be so fantastic. So boom, George and Paul, my fantastic team, got all that up and working on the website, and we are ready to go. Jeremy and I are calling this Improv for Leaders. What you get is Jeremy's mastery of theater games and helping them unlock the brains of business people, coupled with my leadership lens. It's going to be a fantastic experience for teams and groups. I am very proud of it. If you want to know more about it, EssentialCom.com. This is going to be great. Improv for Leaders. I am also excited and grateful for your reviews this month in iTunes. Really, it means so much. Beginning from New Zealand, the Magic Viewer from the UK, Hula Hoop Crisps. And then here in the US, Scott M. Augusta, Enviro Law Coach, KD Yogi, ALGCC, Baby Jewel, JPT47711, and then my friend and colleague, Danielle Bauer. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you to all of you. Really, reviews don't take you long. They last forever for me, and they make such a difference to podcasts like mine. If you want to listen to more episodes about managing your fears, the very first one that I would send you to this month is The Many Parts of You. That's the episode name, The Many Parts of You. It echoes this whole idea of separating parts of you. Five others you might listen to are Combating Emotional Hijacks, Conquering Fear, Negative Self-Talk, Self-Limiting Beliefs, and Unmasking a Stand-In. And if you want to hear my nervousness story, it's Managing Nervousness. That's it for me. Until next time, I'm Tom Henschel. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>